Over the years, the sport of car racing has brought in its fair share of strange people. And that's a good thing, as their crazy antics are part of what makes the sport so interesting. Let's take a look at a few of the strangest people to ever get behind the wheel of a race car. Scuba Racer Retired NASCAR driver Tom Pistone would know a few things about cautionary measures. Pistone says when he started out, he raced on a seedy track run by a man named Andy Granatelli, who hired race car drivers specifically to crash into other cars on the course, hoping to give the audience a thrill. Coming from a place of extreme showmanship would be enough to make anyone nervous, but even by those standards, Pistone may have taken things a bit far. See, in 1960, during a qualifying run at the Daytona Speedway, fellow driver Tommy Irwin lost control of his car and crashed it into Lake Lloyd, the man-made lake at the center of the track. So during Pistone's race, he drove wearing a life preserver and an oxygen tube. You know, in case the worst happened to him. Even odd ducks got afloat. Taste of victory. Some rules in life are easy to follow, like don't down four bottles of champagne while you're driving in the Indy 500. But that's exactly what one racer did. In 1913, during the third Indy 500 in history, Jules Gu was in the lead after only five laps. During a pit stop on lap 15, he ordered some chilled wine. Records vary somewhat, but historians agree that over the next three pit stops, he consumed between four and six bottles of champagne. Or roughly four to six more bottles of champagne than a person is supposed to drink when driving a car with no safety features as fast as they can. The end result? Goo won by a ridiculous 13 minutes. Oh, and race car drivers could no longer drink alcohol during races. I'm too drunk to taste this chicken. Lifetime Lie who hasn't exaggerated a little bit on a job application? Most people have done it once or twice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can wheel, we can deal, we can oversee hostile takeovers, you whatever you need, bud. You it's a mailroom gig. Well, the racer you might know as Jim Rathman may have taken it a little too far. When he was young, Rathman was still going by his real name, Royal Richard Rathman. Royal wanted to go fast, but age restrictions prohibited him from doing so. According to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway's website, he swapped IDs with his older brother Jim and entered a stock car race. He was three years older than I was, and I was satisfied with his driver's license, so that's how I got started driving, and I just kept the name of Jim from then on. He later became an Indy 500 champion and one of the most influential racers of his generation, albeit one with the wrong date of birth listed on his records. Supreme Fine How far would you go for $75? Probably not as far as Bobby Unzer. In 1996, Unzer, a former race car driver, and a friend were out snowmobiling in Colorado when their vehicles broke down. They battled the elements for two days, and when they were rescued, it was discovered that they had been snowmobiling in a designated wilderness area, which is a no-no at the federal level. They were charged a $75 fine. No big deal, right? Well, it was to Bobby Unzer. Yo, I just want to go home. I just want my money. Unzer fought the fine, which again was cheaper than some parking tickets, taking his case all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court declined to hear the case. Dirty Dale. At some point or another, we've all had a special collection of things. But Dale Earnhardt Jr. might have the most bizarre collection of all. While your standard gearhead might have a project car or two, and maybe a shelf covered in Hot Wheels, Earnhardt prefers a more life-sized and objectively weird hobby. He owns a car wreck graveyard. Forget Disneyland. Welcome to Hillbilly Heaven! Yes, Dale Jr.'s equivalent to a stack of comic books is a stretch of land called Dirty Mo Acres, containing dozens of derelict race cars. In it, you can find the remains of such vehicles as a Jimmy Johnson No. 48, Will Powers No. 12 Indy car, which now resides in a tree, and one of Earnhardt's own No. 8 cars, which he told NASCAR.com he uses for target practice. No respect for the dead. Goat Bust Dale Jarrett started his career in racing at the bottom. His father managed a racetrack in North Carolina and gave a teenage Dale a job running errands and performing menial tasks around the property. One of his chores was cutting the lawn on the makeshift grass parking lot. So Dale made what we can all agree was his only logical decision. He traded a golf club for a couple of goats and set them loose on the grass. Thank you for the goat, my friend. <laughs> The problem was, the goats weren't into grass, but they apparently went wild for the upholstery inside a series of decorative wrecked vehicles sitting in the lot. 
Dale later said, All they would eat was the upholstery in the cars and the vinyl tops. They wouldn't eat grass if you put it in their mouths. Monkey shines. Who hasn't wanted a pet monkey at some point? Tim Flock certainly has. But what separates the greats like Flock from the rest of us? Flock did something about it. For eight glorious races in 1953, Tim Flock drove with a Reese's monkey named Jocko Flocko as his co-pilot. Flock even got a little racing suit tailored for the monkey. What does a monkey do in a race car, you might wonder? You know, monkey stuff. On their eighth race together, Jocko managed to open up a trap door in the bottom of the car and then jumped onto Flock's back. Tim Flock pulled over and unloaded the monkey with his pit crew. And that was the end of Jocko's joyriding days. Thanks for watching. Click the grunge icon to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Plus, check out all this cool stuff we know you'll love too.